Hey there everyone, Sisyphus here, back with another boulder to push up a hill for eternity. The spoilers of war opens on a bunch of stinky- Actually, nah, we're gonna do this one backwards. The spoilers of war ends with Jamie riding towards Danny because he thinks he can heroically end the war and Tyrion's all like, Oh no, you fool. But actually, screw that, we're gonna start in the middle. If the show's not going to give us a temporal frame of reference for anything, why should I be held back by the idea that time is linear? The Glidus video on the spoilers of war opens on him reviewing the scene where Bran gives Arya Littlefinger's dagger. Bran is hanging out in the godswood, just... yeah. The writers just fucking give up on explaining what Bran's deal is. I told you it's difficult to explain. Bran has... visions. Ah, I guess the explanation wasn't that difficult after all. Arya, oh yeah, Arya's back now. Arya exhibits extremely little shock when she learns that Bran is omniscient and also alive. Sansa learns about Arya's list for realsies and barely emotes. They're trying to make Bran look like a detached robot, but it's hard to recognize that given that he just kind of blends into the crowd with this lot. Bran pulls out that fine ass dagger from Sam's book. Gee, you think Bran would know about its history, right? And how it came to fall into Peter's possession in the first place? That sounds like a really interesting topic of discussion. Bran's three-eyed Raven's superpower is to inflict extreme confusion on every creature in a 30 foot radius. Little finger. He's here. Why would he give you a dagger? Why? Why would a cutthroat have a Valyrian steel dagger? What do you mean it doesn't matter? Hold up a slippery minute. Someone very wealthy wanted me dead. Wealthy and stupid, I guess. Or like they wanted to send a message, or they were a colossal fuckwit and got mega lucky when presented with the opportunity to pin it on another somehow even larger fuckwit. So he gives Arya the dagger because he's read the season 8 script. Foreshadowing, right? Foreshadowing is real fucking simple. Something's gonna happen, but the author in indicates to the audience that it's gonna happen before it happens. It's functionally identical to a setup and punchline, but with more subtlety and generally more time between the components. Here, Arya receives a weapon that can kill White Walkers. You could say this indicates that she's the one who's going to slay Raga. I mean, it could if it weren't for all those other scenes wherein different characters receive a weapon with the exact same property. This isn't foreshadowing, and even if it was, it wouldn't magically make that branch of the story good. Any moron can foreshadow something. I did it by fucking accident in this very video. Well, I guess these two morons struggle with it. So Bran obviously knows that Littlefinger is the worst, so why isn't he telling his sisters right fucking now? They were talking about him directly in this scene. This right here is the first of many reasons that the conflict at Winterfell through the rest of this season is so unbelievably contrived. Anyway, Drogon melts a bunch of Lannister soldiers. How these other men are holding their positions is beyond me. Penis Charlie also seems in disbelief at their obedience. Some horse boys ride in through some fire, and only now are these men breaking formation. I know that cavalry breaks infantry lines, but did you guys not see the dragon? The big flying lizard what breathed fire on us? This Nobel Prize contender dismounts for no discernible purpose, cuts some red persons and then gets skewered. Imagine everyone in heaven sharing the stories of their death and you're the one idiot who says, I thought it would be cool if I jumped off my horse. Okay. This is epic. I'm serious though, there's this awesome behind the scenes video on this battle and it's absolutely amazing how all of these extremely talented people are coordinating such an amazing job. This scene is a mind boggling achievement in both digital and practical effects and I don't want to undercut that. As a visual spectacle, it's a total delight. These cunts fucking stand up on the horses they're riding and willingly throw themselves off. It's totally bonkers. They set 20 guys on fire at once and they killed Ed Sheeran apparently. All through this video, Everyone is so competent and passionate, except for Devis and Dutthead, who sound like they have no clue what they're talking about because they don't. The script they wrote might as well say, they fight. They're using a story to tell special effects, not the other way around. Special effects are just a tool, a means of telling a story. People have a tendency to confuse them as an end to themselves. So this scene is a total feast for the eyes. Luckily for the tonal consistency of my series, however, nothing makes any fucking sense. For example, Jamie and Bronn sit around on their horses commanding these archers to shoot at Drogon. Jamie knows they have the big boy and that it's the only effective anti-dragon weapon, so why is he wasting all this time? Jamie gets into what looks like a boss fight for a bit, but Penis saves him because Jamie's too important to die to a nameless Dothraki person guy. On his way to the big boy, Bronn gets his horse done in and loses his cash. He decides that his life 
life is worth more than a bag of shiny because perhaps more life means more shiny. They do the bastard ball thing of the long chaotic shot following a main character around and it's pretty good. Brom totally lucks out with this rogue wagon blocking his pursuer's path but this is a video game so it's all cool. The guy gets off his horse to follow Bron because he looks important I guess. We later see Bron loading the Scorpio and it takes him at least 18 seconds but here he has 10 seconds at best before Einstein walks in. So the implication then is that it was already loaded when he got there but isn't transporting loaded heavy artillery across bumpy ground an unfathomably stupid idea? Cool Tyrion's here that's that's great I'm so glad you came. I get it, you want to show Tyrion struggling with his queen destroying his family, that's great, perfect, beautiful, I'm so happy for you, except no! He is a political advisor and, I can't believe I'm about to say this, a campaign strategist. He is not required at the top of a nearby hill where any number of things could kill him, especially after all the agitation about it being too dangerous for Danny to fly around on top of a dragon. I take it as a personal insult that they would include Tyrion in this scene just so he can look concerned and call Jaime a- <laughs> Drogon returns to kill some human males and Brun starts shooting. The dragon somehow flaps his wings without displacing any of the smoke. That's incredible. And oh my god, Danny, your hair is so pretty. Mine always gets so messed up when I'm flying on Dragonback. How do you do that, Gorge? Bron gets the hit and Blackhawk down, I guess. <coughs> Bron somehow isn't pompeyed by this. Oh shit, is this foreshadowing for how good at diving Bron is? Drogon lands and destroys a wagon because fuck that wagon in particular. Danny. Oh, okay, so Daenerys, who is completely vulnerable just wearing her goth sparkly queen dress, dismounts from her dragon in the middle of a battlefield to very painfully remove the bolts from Drogon's tum-tum, even though he can clearly defend himself just fine. Jamie, who the Dothraki are ignoring I guess, takes the opportunity to try to skewer Danny. I like this, and knowing what they end up doing with Jamie in season 8, they should have just let him die a hero here instead of letting Bronn miraculously survive a second load of dragon fire. The heat of dragon flame has been demonstrated before, and it bothers me that none of this water is instantly boiling. Jamie sinks, allowing Danny's troops to pursue and capture his drowned corpse, but I guess that's going to happen off screen, like so many other major plot points. Anyway, that's where the episode ends, but the video must go on. What scene's next then? Well, let's spin the wheel of continuity. Cersei and Tycho talking about fees. K-I-L-L -L space M-E. I really like this scene, aside from the minor quibble that it's complete nonsense. Uh Okay, listen, I'm gonna give you money, but first you gotta give me money and also there'll be interest rates. And they're not talking about promises here because Tycho asks about the physical gold they'll be receiving before he gives Cersei different physical gold. And he's a bank, so there'll be interest on that gold. So why not just keep the Tyrell gold and use that to hire Buck Strickland? Is this scene supposed to demonstrate Cersei's ruthless efficiency? Because I can't think of a more inefficient way of acquiring funds than this. Say I wanna borrow 20 bucks from you because the 60 packs of ramen are on sale. But I already owe you 20 bucks from you supporting my feudal regime. So I steal 20 bucks from my mate and give it to you so you can give me 20 bucks and I promise to pay interest on that. Nothing's changed except the interest. It's a total waste of time and effort. Arya arrives at Winterfell even though we already saw her in the Godswood earlier. That's weird. She's confronted at the door by the ghosts of seasons past. Have you seen? The Void. The Void. The Void. Have you seen the void? Has the void seen you? Has it looked back? Uh. Send for Mr. Lewin. Oh, Sir Roderick. So Arya knows that it's been six years and the Boltons had Winterfell at some point, yet she assumes that both Lewin and Roderick are still alive. Which Lady Stark? Are you fucking... Who else could it be? And why would you think it's impressive or convincing that you know her name? Arya defeats the guards in a game of logic. <laughs> And they make her sit down for a bit while they fetch Sansa. The nostalgia hits her in the face and she seems to embrace her identity as a Stark now that she's home again. This is good setup for her working cohesively with her family for the rest of the season. She then teleports, which again, good setup. <laughs> Where to next, almighty wheel? Somewhere between Highgarden and Utah, the Lannister forces chill out. There are only lions and huntsmen, so Randall Tarly is literally the only lord who is fighting for Cersei here. Maybe Kyburn was lying about the Scorpios being his secret weapon, and he actually has an even secreter shrink ray that's constantly making the entire continent smaller, little by little. Explains a lot. Randy tells Jeremy that all the Tyrell gold has safely made it to King's Landing, minimizing the consequences of that battle we saw earlier in the future. We need to get the last of these wagons over the Blackwater Rush before nightfall. 
Okay, so they've got across the river to... If you haven't even crossed the rush yet, how has all the gold made it to King's Landing? You sent it that far ahead without the army to protect it? Does Cersei's pointless repayment and reborrowing have an urgent deadline that's worth risking everything? Well, we are stretched a bit thin. Why? What possible reason could you have for being so disorganized when you know that your enemy has dragons that can do untold damage? So Jamie, break on. Dick on. <laughs> Penis Tali tells us about the experience of his first battle. Men shit themselves when they die. Well, I learnt it when I was five. Unusual, Ben, yet satisfactory. This show is so fast and loose when it comes to armies surprising other armies. Okay, so we know that it's evening, so judging by the angle of the lighting, the Dothraki are coming from the west fucking somehow. I mean, they're on Westeros fucking somehow. Do you think Danny ferried them over on the dragons like 20 at a time? Because there's no way she has any more ships after these disasters. So when Anyway, they're coming from the west, which if we're about to cross the Blackwater Rush, should be Lannister-controlled territory. I don't care how good the Dothraki are. Given how much food they would need to sustain the Horde, it is impossible that they would go undetected through enemy territory for as long as they would need to have gone undetected. In short, I'm calling bullshit. Again, I understand spectacle. Hell, I like spectacle as demonstrated earlier, but I can't appreciate it when it doesn't make sense. Bronn advises Jaime to just like go to King's Landing, just you know, go there. It's easy. He's like, nah, we got this, which is just precious. Only a fool would meet the Dothraki in an open field. Then a dragon shows up and Danny says, Dracai! But weirdly, just as shit's about to cut loose, we go back to Winterfell. Over two years of lessons and he's still shit. I think that says less about him as a student and more about you as a teacher. Of course, Brienne's always been a lousy teacher. Consistency is key. Arya knows how stunning and brave she is, so she just kind of barges in. She wants to duel Brienne because. The word train is thrown around, but not only is this not that, we also never see Arya training at all. Peter looks all sus, because it's a day that ends with a Y, and this should absolutely be the moment that Peter decides to leave Winterfell. There's nothing for him here except mistrust and a big scary lady who will kill him as soon as any evidence pops up from the evidence machine. But he's got a private chamber, so... Fucking when did Arya learn to be all super swishy like this? She trained a little with Sirio in Season 1, trained by herself in Season 4, and then the Waif beat the shit out of her at Bunch and Bravos, and that's it. That's all the weapon training Arya has received. She didn't even have Needle at the House of Black and white. Get the fuck out with this. Brienne has got a decade of actual training on Arya and a giant ass sword. She threw. Yes, the choreography is great and it's impressive that Maisie made herself left-handed to be book accurate for no reason whatsoever, but it doesn't make any sense. Who taught you how to do that? No one. Right, because this is a fever dream. All right, time to spin that wheel again. On the steps out the front of Dragonstone High School, Danny and Missandei talk about boys. Because they're such good friends. I mean, because- Missandei is the Queen's most trusted advisor. She just vibes that Danny has a crush on Jon. Oh my God, I've never seen a more beautiful mound of volcanic glass. Jon takes Danny to see some cave drawings, having only moments ago disposed of his chalk. The whole cave scene is dumb fuckery and can be summed up with, how could you possibly know that? Anything of intrigue here is never expanded upon and is essentially fluff. It seems like these drawings which should absolutely be pivotal in figuring shit out about the White Walkers were just a vehicle to show us a growing relationship between Jon and Daenerys. I'd be fine with that happening if there was, you know, anything of substance going on. What an insane way to direct someone you're not very close with. They fought together. How could you possibly know that? See, it works. It's annoying to me that Danny doesn't question any of Jon's deductions here. This proves the White Walkers are real, but anything beyond that is up to interpretation. But Danny agrees to fight with Jon. When he bends the knee. Oh snap, she still doesn't get it. But neither does Jon. We went over this conflict last episode. It's dumb and it hasn't changed. Isn't there survival, Isn't there survival more important than your pride? pride? I'm glad they quoted the season other than the first one, but what are the chances she would phrase this exactly the same way John phrased it to Mance? Fuck my bride. And why doesn't John respond in kind? He's in the right on that question, just like Mance was. This is a quote for quoting's sake, and it just hurts my brain. Back on the beach, Danny learns of the bullshit. Well, hang me from the rafters and call me a bat. They actually bring up food. But yeah, nah, it doesn't matter at all. We still have enough ships to carry the Dothraki to the mainland. How? 
You lost one fleet transporting an army, you lost a second fleet transporting a different army. Ilaria and Olena are out for the count, so surely their vassals aren't going to support Danny. So what fucking ships are you talking about? Danny spits the dummy at Tyrion and accuses him of still being aligned with his family, but nothing comes of this. Danny decides to melt things, but she doesn't know what things to melt, so she asks John. He says people don't like castles being melted and prefer to be blockaded and besieged, so she decides to melt armies instead. Oh shoot, I lost a turn. Wait, I'm the only one playing. Spin again, fuckface. Oh hells yeah! Littlefinger gives Bran the dagger and it's the most confusing thing ever, especially considering that Bran gave it to Arya earlier. Weird. Do you know who this belonged to? No. Really hoping nobody knows you pinned the dagger on Tyrion, aren't you, mate? Like, why not keep up the lie? Or just say, it was Tyrion's once, but I don't think he wanted you dead. It's just so stupid! Of course, this line only exists to remind the audience how big of an impact the attempt on Bran's life had, because of course, we're all fucking goldfish. Well, fuck, would you look at that? Chaos is a ladder. Bran quotes season three, which is cool. In fact, this line on its own is pretty good, forgetting that when Littlefinger said it, it was in reference to something completely unrelated. But I guess it shows PD that Bran just, like, knows shit. It's one of the few quotings that actually makes sense, and it's honestly intimidating. I like that the only thing that can take Littlefinger down is fucking omniscience, except that's not how they portray it in the end. The biggest fuckery of this episode, and maybe the whole season, is that after this, Peter just stays. He just sits around waiting to die. Mira shows up and I guess we're spinning the wheel again. Those guards from earlier tell Sansa that Arya is here. She assumes that Arya went to the crypts because she's so fucking smart and talented and gorgeous. Don't you just want to lick her brain? Sansa avoids telling Arya that Rickon is dead because she's genius enough to know that it's her fault. Instead, they talk about, um, uh, hmm. Just... So Sansa says Bran's home too, which is strange because I already met Bran in that earlier scene. Weird. Mira shows up so she can stop showing up, and that's the scene. The writers allow her to be a character for the first time since season 4 as she drops some reality on Wheelie Bran. Oh yeah, he has a wheelchair now, I didn't mention that earlier. Mira's sick of this shit and peaces out. Peace out? Whatever, fuck it. Spin the wheel. Jesus Christ, the steps outside Dragonstone High are seeing a lot of usage today. Fake Dave accuses John of finding Danny attractive. A thousand less, fewer. Hmm, maybe I was wrong. This could be the real Davos, and maybe he just drank the amnesia water sooner than I thought, and it somehow left behind the single memory of Stannis being a dick about grammar. But how would he have. Wait. What if the amnesia water is the narrow sea? There's no time for that. Ah, yep, fair enough. For some reason, the showrunners decided to inform us that Missandei doesn't know about bastards. She explains her position in the most wooden way possible. The concept of a bastard doesn't exist. That sounds... Liberating. I don't know why Davos is being such a creep around Missandei. Maybe Amnesia Water doubles as a powerful aphrodisiac. So Theon and the men who impossibly saved him arrive on Dragonstone and, well, this is awkward. Well, moving on. Oh shit, I've got to spin this. Bankrupt? Oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck. Nice. Jamie and Bronn established the premise for the battle we saw a while back. Strange that they're back at Highgarden after falling into that river. It's a real accomplishment for non-linear storytelling. But the only other thing this episode has in common with Finnegan's Wake is they were both written by total drunks. They both agreed that there is no High Septon, which I don't want to fucking get into. Let's just all agree that it's garbage. garbage. Bronn asks for Highgarden because who even cares anymore? Every single Tyrell is dead. Sure, fuck it, why not? Garth Greenhand, who's that? Jamie promises him a castle after the war is won, and Bronn says, Yes, I'm sure Queen Cersei's reign will be quiet and peaceable. So why the fuck is he even fighting for her? I just don't get it. Jamie sends Bronn, Randall, and Penis to collect the harvest, which I guess only takes them a couple hours. Yeah, the reach isn't even that big. 
Not that much food at all in the reach. What do you mean I have to spin it again? There's only one option. Ah, fuck. Well, seeing as I've just gone bankrupt, check out my Patreon and send me 20 bucks for that ramen. I'm saving up for a shipment of amnesia water too, hoping that'll solve all my problems. Thanks to my sugar daddies. Andreas. Stay 78. Glenis. Soy Boy Malloy. Kevin. Forrest and Gabriel for funding said amnesia water addiction. Subscribe and shit so you don't miss next week's train wreck. Strange thing to schedule in advance, train wrecks, but here we are. Wait, what the fuck happened to- Chaos is a- Break, 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 break,